coordinate this meeting and, and also to facilitate. Thank you, Katie, for hitting the record button. <laughs> So I'm Lauren Olson and I've been asked to um, also facilitate tonight's meeting. So this meeting happens um, because the legislature, um, especially um, Senator Dibble and Representative Hornstein, really wanted to make sure that the public was getting information on the topic of rail safety while construction is occurring in the Southwest Light Rail Corridor. Um, they know there's a lot of questions and there can be concerns and um, the legislature asked the city of Minneapolis to be the host of this meeting and to coordinate this and to bring certain stakeholders together at least once a year. And um, so that's what we're doing tonight. Um, again, the agenda is listed in the um, chat, uh, but tonight we are going to hear three presentations. Um, some of the people you're going to hear from tonight, um, you may have heard from before if you've attended these meetings, but we do have new information for you this year. Um, so you will be hearing an update from the Southwest Light Rail Project Office from Jim Alexander. Um, you will also hear from our fire chief. Um, we about the exercise that was done in the corridor this summer. I think many of you uh, are participated in some way in that exercise and there was a public component. So the chief will kind of talk about what um, that exercise did. And um, finally, we will hear uh, from Mark from Twin Cities and Western Railroad uh, about safety measures that railroads use and some updates on recent issues. Um, and as always, we appreciate everyone participating. We appreciate the participation of the, the railroad to bring valuable perspective. So without further ado, um, if there isn't any question about the process here, we'll queue up um, Jim Alexander to share his presentation. All right, thanks, Lauren. Should I go ahead and uh, share my screen then? Yeah, go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm, I'm Jim Alexander, project director I'm with the Met Council and uh, been with this project for quite some time and uh, been uh, presenting at these uh, venues for the past few years, as Lauren had mentioned. So I have a short PowerPoint to uh, go through and uh, if there are questions, I also want to touch base on uh, some recent uh, issues we've had with uh, with the tunnel excavation. I'll just tell you that uh, we are, uh, overall the tunnel is a little over 60% uh, complete right now. We have, uh, this is divided up into uh, cells that we, uh, the contractor builds this tunnel through uh, numerous cells, there's about 30 of them. And 17 of those uh, cells are, we have the tunnel structure complete. So we're pretty far along, but we're still uh, primarily uh, just embarking on the on the west part as we go past the Cedar Isles condominium over to uh, West Lake Street Bridge. So I'll share my PowerPoint here. And I should ask, can everybody, can Lauren, can you hear me okay? I can hear you and I can see your PowerPoint, but I can also see your thumbnails if you wanted to make that presentation mode. Um, yeah. Or it's fine, whatever. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm, I might, I'm, I've tried that before and I get uh, some weird okay. screens. If you don't mind, but it's a slideshow at the top. Yeah, I'll just, uh, well, uh, I think uh, everybody by now knows what this project is about. Uh, we're extending 14 and a half miles from the green line that runs to St. Paul uh, from downtown Minneapolis, and this will extend all the way out to Eden Prairie. So we are focusing, uh, of course, in the Minneapolis area where we are building a tunnel up through Westlake uh, Street and just uh, short of the channel that uh, that connects the uh, Cedar Lake with the uh, uh, Lake the Isles there. And a lot of these uh, slides are going to be fairly similar to what we had uh, in past, except for this uh, photo is uh, fairly recent where you see the train going by. Uh, off to the right there is the vertical circulator that is tied to the Westlake Street Bridge and uh, that uh, that and you see where the uh, kind of the, the dirt pile is, that's where the tunnel starts. And we 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 start into what's called the boat section because the train uh, needs some uh, certain gradient to get down to uh, to grade at the uh, at the tunnel. And uh, so the tunnel progresses uh, past the uh, Cedar Isles condominium 
that you can see in the background. But uh, as we uh, as we embark on our work, uh, we uh, we take uh, freight rail uh, very seriously. We're we're tied out with uh, Mark Wagner and his team at TCNW. They have flaggers on site as we uh, do their work. Uh, all the contractors and our staff as well are required to check in with the flagger when we uh, arrive on site. And uh, they are they are the flaggers are in touch with the, the railroad traffic. So there's a lot of coordination that happens between the contractor, the Met Council and TCNW primarily through the flaggers. TCNW also has a as an on-site uh, engineer that uh, that is involved in the observation as we as we move forward with construction. So freight rail track is uh, the conditions are monitored uh, during the day. We particularly uh, we check the check the track before a uh, a, a train comes through to uh, ensure that uh, we have uh, adequate uh, conditions for the train to come through the area, and uh, we. Uh, we uh, we have a set of monitoring uh, uh, specs specifications to uh, that we adhere to in terms of uh, how much uh, movement we are allowing for the for the rail. It's it's pretty minimal, and uh, this is more conservative than the FRA would uh, would entail. We want to make sure that we have a a, a very safe uh, operation here as we're running next to construction. And um, if a track is inspected and found to be out of compliance, uh, we stop the work. Uh, the TCNW flagger who's on site is, is contacted and that train movement is uh, is stopped. And then we uh, remedy the situation before train traffic comes through. And there's also rail maintenance activities that are periodic to come through to, uh, you'll see some, uh, some big yellow machines coming through. One's called a tamper, one's called a dynamic stabilizer that uh, essentially uh, compacts uh, the ballast underneath the tracks to make sure that's stable for the uh, for the for the trains to come through. And this next image uh, will show that a little bit. There's uh, some inspectors that uh, give them a photo opportunity here. To uh, we have some devices here on the rail to uh, to measure um, uh, what is uh, you know what's going on at the rail. We have uh, we have manual inspection. We also have automatic inspection as well that uh, goes into a database, so we can track that uh, remotely as well as on site. And then off to the uh, off to the the left is uh, some of the equipment that I spoke of that uh, that we use to uh, to stabilize the area under the tracks um, as we're uh, doing our work. So this is a. Uh, a slide that I've shared in the past. Just uh, you now, this is for a non-emergency incident. That uh, if there is something observed, whoever observes that, they go straight to the site supervisor and go straight to TCW flagging, and it uh, it alerts our folks as well. We uh, we alert uh, we alert City of Minneapolis Public Works, and that uh, carries on to whomever it might affect. Now, this is really non a non-emergency situation. If it is an emergency situation, 9-11 is called right away and uh, and Chief Tyner and his folks are, are engaged immediately as uh, as the incident uh, arises. Uh, we also uh, uh, alert uh, leadership. So we have director of construction. We have uh, Nick Dial who's on the on the call here. We have uh, our our lead on on uh, on this part of the construction, Andy Collum, that uh, they're notified as well. And uh, we get uh, communication out to the community as needed. And uh, on the on the left side there, TCW, TCW flaggers alerted, and it's all kind of happening at the same time where dispatch gets notified. And then that uh, that project manager they spoke of for TCW gets notified as well. So there's a lot of communication lines that happen when something something does occur. And in terms of construction safety, it's uh, safety training is required for all uh, construction staff and uh, sa safety out on the construction sites under the jurisdiction of OSHA and uh, FRA. So we follow those uh, their, their requirements as we're working through through the, the work here and uh, all construction personnel undergo that uh, safety training to identify and report safety issues. So I want to talk about an issue that uh, has come up uh, over the past couple of weeks where we had uh, some settlement under the uh, under the rail tracks. And uh, so so what had happened there is uh, and if I'm going to try to switch uh, switch PowerPoints and hopefully this works. If it doesn't, uh, let me know. Are you seeing a different uh, slide here? 
cross yeah, section. We can, see, we, we can see that. Yeah. OK, I shared this with uh, Sidna and Kenwood some time ago, but it's just uh, it's just a kind of a diagram to show what the excavation looks like. So you can see the see the rail car here and uh, you can see the sheets that go down. This is not to scale. So the sheet piles, if you looked at in plan view, they're corrugated. They look like this. And uh, essentially, for most of the tunnel, we have sheet pile on both sides. And those sheets in, in, the, in the particular place we're talking about, this is between Cedar Lake Parkway and the West Lake Street Bridge. Um, they go down about 70 feet. And so the excavation goes down about 40 feet with uh, we're about 20 feet into the groundwater. And uh, what had happened is uh, in the case where we're in, it's called a CW8, uh, it's, just a, it's just a terminology the contractor uses to identify the different cells. We, had sh we have sheets on one side and we, uh, we talked about the secant pile some time ago with folks. Uh, secant piles are installed on the, uh, on the opposite side or we call the field side where the Cedar Isles condominium is located. Well, what had happened as uh, the sheets were pressed in uh, several years ago, uh, we had some uh, split uh, sheets happening where things separated at this uh, at this joint here, and it's probably more likely caused by uh, hitting some boulders or cobbles as the sheets were pushed into the ground. And uh, so what is what's happening? I'm not showing groundwater here, but keep in mind that the excavation again is about 40 feet deep. These sheets go down about 70 feet. And I'm about 20 feet into the groundwater. So this concrete seal is not here yet as we're talking about the particular cell I'm speaking of. And so as as that uh, as that excavation proceeds down to where that separation is occurring, we have a gap. And what happens is soil and water want to come in from the outside from under the rail tracks into the excavation. And that ends up propagating into a settlement situation up under the tracks. And so we had that occurrence, and uh, I think uh, many of you are, are aware that we had to do some night work to uh, to remedy that. And uh, we had uh, subsequent settlement, uh, the, the, like the following day or the next day, where we had to take care of that uh, of that issue. And so what we have done with uh, Mark Wagner's team is to look at um, try to work a little more closely with Mark on work windows when we can uh, progress with work on the uh, to uh, to uh, continue the excavation and um, and get this tunnel built and we need a kind of a work window from 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 Mark so he's working with us to uh, to do that so what has to happen is we're underwater by about 20 feet keep that in mind as the excavation is proceeding underwater we have divers that go down and inspect the sheets so they inspect both on the secant side and the sheet side to see if there's any gaps, anything that's looking irregular. And if, it, if there is a gap, then they will weld plates over that gap to prevent soil and water from coming into the excavation. So it's an iterative process where a little gets a little bit gets dug out and then the well, the, the, the diver goes down, they have to weld a plate and then they'll dig a little bit more but before we get going with uh with train traffic we we need to button everything up in terms of how far we've dug that day and get it back on on top with those yellow pieces of equipment to stabilize the uh the tracks before we can proceed and then we would carry on hopefully the next work window we have the following day or whenever that comes up again so kind of a lot there, um, but uh, I did want to I did want to talk about that issue because I think it's probably on the minds of some folks, particularly at the at the at the route townhomes that are right nearby there. And uh, so maybe I'll uh, get back to my original presentation. I think I I think that was all I had for that. Yeah. So Lauren, that's that's really the the uh, the end of my presentation. And uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to just go through all the uh, all the all the speakers and uh, and do questions. I'd be glad to take any as we move along here. Yeah, I'm sure that people have questions, but at least the way we planned it for tonight was that we are going to complete the presentations and then we have a lot of time set aside to have the Q&A. So please jot down your questions. Um, we're going to proceed to the next presentation. Um, I just as the fire chief gets ready to do that. Um, I just want to thank again people for joining us, including um, Senator Dibble and Representative Hornstein are joining us tonight and Councilmember Palmazano. I see a lot of other um, staff from the county.
it from um, the railroads. Um, so appreciate you all joining us. Um, so go ahead and uh, Chief, when you're ready, if you'd like to give your presentation. All right, I'll jump right in. Uh Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Fire Chief Brian Tyner, and uh, I'm honored to be able to present to you today. So uh, I do have a presentation ready, so I will just uh, jump right into it. Hope. Oh. All right, can you guys see this? We, I cannot. Can Is that just yeah. me? Nope. nope. Okay, then I did something wrong. Let's see. Some reason I'm seeing everyone looking frozen. <laughs> there we go, Chief. There we go. All right, there we go. Okay, so um, for some of you, this may be new information. For some of this, this may be a review. Uh, I'm going to start out with a lot of the information that I presented last year before going into uh, a little bit of information about the the uh, the exercise that we did this summer. I'd usually like to ground everyone with our mission statement, and that is employees of the Minneapolis Fire Department are thoroughly trained to protect lives, property, and the environment by rapidly responding to emergencies and hazardous situations. The MFD is committed to prevention by working with the community to reduce risk to life, property, and the environment. Um, so for Hazardous materials incidents, which is what a uh, trained derailment uh, it is, could possibly be, not necessarily, but uh, the MFD employs a hazardous materials team 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That team is led by Ladder 9 and Engine 11 and is located at Fire Station 11. And since our last update last year, uh, the MFD hazmat team has actually been contracted and recognized by the state of Minnesota as a state chemical assessment team. Now, what this means is that we've actually had more capabilities uh, than we did before and uh, more funding to be able to have all of the, uh, you know, the latest gadgets and gizmos. But we're also bigger in that we we partner with the uh, Spring uh, Blaine Mount or Spring Lake Park Blaine and Mount uh, Department as part of that state chemical assessment team. The MFD also maintains mutual aid agreements with other fire departments uh, surrounding us along the rail, rail corridor, as well as the railroad itself to maximize our response capabilities. Uh, we can try conduct training uh, daily for all manner of hazards. We are an all hazards department but that includes hazardous materials emergencies and more specifically the mitigation of hazardous materials emergencies associated with train derailments. The MFD also conducts tabletop exercises as well as live exercises in partnership with the rail industry annually to keep our skills uh, current. Uh, this is a uh, picture of a school that I attended uh, in Colorado, it was a uh, an oil tanker school. Uh, that uh, guy in the white helmet in the middle there uh, getting ready to uh, deploy that charge hose line, that's me. So uh, we were able to actually put this out with just uh, two hose lines and uh, some of the uh, chemicals that we, that we carry on our rigs now. Uh, expectations uh, that you should have in the case of an incident. Uh, our hazardous materials teams will respond in addition to other Minneapolis Fire Department resources. Uh, the incident commander will take command and decide based upon how the incident presents our mitigation strategy or how we're going to deal with the emergency and if additional support is required and if an evacuation is required or if it would be more appropriate to shelter in place. Uh, the factors that go into these decisions are constantly monitored to keep up with the changes to the incident. Communication will occur as to whether we are asking residents to shelter in place or evacuate along with instructions as to how large the evacuation zone is and which direction you should go. Uh, some of the decisions that go into an evacuation decision is the specific hazard. Is it a fire? Is it a spill? Uh, what type of product or are we dealing with or is it multiple products? The decision that we make will always be based upon the greatest hazard that we are facing using the emergency response guide 
and or our hazardous materials emergency response software, which uh, helps us uh, in uh, making a lot of these decisions and, and giving us the properties of the product. Weather is a factor, uh, not weather just as hot, whether it's hot or cold, which is a factor, but primarily the wind direction. Uh, we don't want to, to uh, evacuate anyone into uh, a plume or some other situation, so we're going to generally look to evacuate uphill and upwind. Topography comes into play if it's a uh, uh, something that's on the ground. So again, uphill and upwind. Communication to residents will occur by leveraging all methods of communication available to us to include, but not limited to, uh, messaging pushed out to cell phones and electronic devices using the iPaul system. For those of you who attended the exercise this summer, uh, we did a test message on the iPod system that, uh, you know, rang up all of your phones and, and uh, iPads and everything, uh, much in the same way as you receive a, a uh, what's the alert that you get when a child gets lost? It just, just left my head. Amber anyway. alert. Amber alert, thank you. Yes, <laughs> much in the same way as when you receive an Amber alert. Uh, social media, including the MFD's Twitter page and also other City of Minneapolis social media pages. Uh, oftentimes when we put it out on there, uh, the media uh, sources around the area are also willing to pick that up and, and help broadcast that out. Traditional media to include radio and television. And also we do door-to-door -door notifications by firefighters and law enforcement uh, to make sure that people uh, know what to do. So with that, I'd like to go a little bit into the Ken, Kenwood Rail exercise uh, that we conducted this summer. Uh, we had a whole uh, scenario all planned out. We didn't get a chance to get through the whole scenario. We ran out of time, but uh, I will take you through uh, the scenario that we planned out and certainly talk about the things that we did get to do. So it started out with the classroom session in which we were kind of able to talk to everybody about uh, hazmat responses what our capabilities are uh, and what they would be looking at when we got out on the scene. Uh, our situation that our fictional situation that we were working with was uh, engine 16 reported several rail cars have derailed and are possibly leaking. Uh, the crews when they arrived of course staged uphill and upwind as they are supposed to and uh, created an initial isolation zone which was at uh, 330 feet in all directions and began to establish uh, what we call our emergency zones, the hot zone, which is the zone immediately around the emergency, the warm zone, which is where we decontaminate people, and the cold zone, which is the safe area. Uh, they were met by rail workers on scene who report the train uh, hit is unoccupied. Oh, excuse me, that the train hit an unoccupied construction vehicle that was parked on the tracks. There was a possibility that gas cylinders were involved, and engine 16 it upgraded to a first alarm, including the hazmat team, as they should, because this is not something that they can handle alone. Uh, from there, uh, they're, excuse me, I'm sorry, they're asked to isolate and deny entry uh, so that people don't run into the emergency scene. Uh, the hazmat team responding en route uh, gets their updated information from engine 16. Uh, that there was an occupant of a vehicle that was involved in the accident, that there were several acetylene tanks that were ejected from the vehicle, uh, that the placard was on there labeled UN 1170 on the derailed rail car. Uh, the rail car is next to another derailed car labeled UN 1987. Uh, these are the uh, labels that we can use to identify the products uh, that, may, that would have been in these rail cars. At the time we arrived, there was no fire, a possible leak coming from one of the rail cars, and uh, engine 16 contacted dispatch to shut down rail traffic, which is important because we don't want another accident on top of this one, and we want to create a safe area for us to work. When the hazmat team arrived, uh, and this is kind of where we started to kind of see things uh, happening while we were there, uh, they set up the hazmat group with a group lead, a safety officer, a research team, an entry and recon team, a decon team, which 
uh, cleans all the product off of everyone that was in the hot zone. And uh, engine 16 still site control, which basically means keeping everybody out of there. Hazmat Command confirms the notification to the state duty officer. That's something we talked about in class. Uh, we always let them know when the state duty officer gets us the other resources that we need. Uh, they also contact the railroad emergency personnel to confirm what the train was carrying and confirm that the tracks have been set, shut down and uh, set up command board in the mobile lab, which uh, if you were there, you got to see after the the uh, exercise, but I have a picture in coming up and start researching on those products. <laughs> and that is a picture of the mobile command van. Uh, it was parked outside of the area we were sitting in, but as you can see after the uh, exercise, we were kind of giving everybody a tour of all the vehicles, and this is a picture of that. I will say we did get a nice day for this. Uh, the actions that the hazmat team took, uh, again, identify the product, uh, the container, the environment, uh, the problem, uh, make an evaluation of the hazard risk, and develop an incident action plan is what the IEP stands for. Uh, basically, the goals of the incident, the objectives, the tactical objectives that we have to undertake to uh, take care of the problem, uh, assign the resources to do that, actually mitigate the problem, which means actually doing the work, actually carrying out those tactical objectives, uh, determine how we're going to do it and whether we're going to take an offensive or a defensive posture. Offensive posture, we're going in and we're handling the problem. A defensive posture, we're staying away and just kind of throwing in water or things from the outside. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the actual exercise site. Uh, we set up tents because it was a hot day that day so that uh, people could at least stand in the shade. And uh, as you can see, that's our uh, hazmat captain kind of explaining to everybody what was going on as things were happening. So this is what we actually saw was the recon team. Uh, the recon team determines the uh, correct uh, protective equipment that they need to wear to get in, uh, determine the monitors and equipment that they're gonna need to bring in. Uh, they set up the emergency decon for hazmat personnel uh, going down range so that they can be uh, decontaminated from the product, uh, develop a reconnaissance plan based on the information given. And uh, once the team signs off on the plan, inform command of the plan and get support of that and then implement the plan. Uh, so the recon and the backup team, uh, they use the gators, which I'm gonna have show you a picture of right now. Uh, it's basically a four-wheeler. as transportation, it's a small four-wheeler. And the backup team maintains a line of sight uh, during the recon operation so that if the recon team goes down or a member goes down, they're there to uh, rescue them and back them up. Uh, and they stage approximately 150 feet from that entry team. And that is a picture of the recon team. Uh, that vehicle is what we refer to as the Gator. Those uh, machines you see sitting on the ground are uh, monitors that the recon team set up to be able to monitor the air and uh, determine if any product was uh, in the air or uh, leaking around. So the derailment that we were having to imagine was uh, the three non-pressurized cars, uh, the derailed cars, and we talked about this already, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, uh, but it was UN 1170, uh, one car has a tear approximately one foot long, but no product is leaking from the tear because as we've explained, uh, these uh, cars are, you know, they're double jacketed. So uh, there can be a tear on the outside without the whole thing being breached. Two other rail cars were dented, but not breached. Uh, three other cars have not derailed, but have UN 1987 in there. And just in front of the derailed cars, there are several undamaged acetylene tanks laying on their side on the ground. The vehicle that was hit is unoccupied at approximately 300 feet from the rail cars, which is good. That means we don't have any uh, human victims at this point. Uh, I included this picture. Again, this is a picture when we were uh, looking at all the different vehicles and kind of explaining uh, what everybody had just uh, witnessed. 
uh, with the recon as uh, I'm, people found out they were there. Hazmat scenes move really slow yeah, in real time. Uh, it's it's something where you don't want to rush in until you know exactly what you're dealing with, assuming you don't have any life safety hazards. If there is a person down or life safety hazard, of course, we do rush in and do the rescue and then slow down again. But in this case, we didn't have any life safety issues. I know that was a whole lot of jargon I threw out. But uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Chief, we're going uh, we're going to try to hold questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. okay. And I know people, I mean, these are both been really interesting presentations. So I know that there are a lot of questions, but we're going to ask people to hold off a little bit longer. Um, going to invite um, Mark Wagner. Mark, if you're here with us to... So once again, we appreciate that Mark from Twin Cities and Western Railroad um, is joining us once again. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Twin Cities and Western Railroad Company, and um, it's going to kind of share an update from a railroad perspective. So thanks. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Um, for the benefit of new people on this call this year, uh, Twin City and Western is the freight rail operator that basically originates and terminates freight in uh, western Minnesota and northeastern South Dakota and it, it goes through this corridor on its way to interchange in St. Paul with the um, large railroad carriers and so um, we operate through the Kenilworth corridor at 10 mile an hour even though the track is maintained to a much higher speed standard but we we stuck stick with the 10 mile an hour I know that's an issue with people they don't believe we're going 10 mile an hour but we do uh, operationally test our trains, including with a radar gun to ensure that they are. And even if somebody uh, said they were grossly speeding, we've had several times where we've downloaded the locomotive and the, the, the event recorder shows they were going less than 10 mile an hour. So uh, looks can be deceiving, but trust me, all of our train crews that operate through that area know the sensitivity of the 10 mile an hour uh, standard that the uh, residents expect. Um, with respects to hazardous materials, um, we serve two ethanol plants, and so we do uh, run ethanol through the corridor. We do it safely. Um, all those train cars are inspected at the ethanol plant to ensure that all of the tank cars are properly sealed and all that kind of thing. And then um, we, we bring them on. We have two types of ethanol trains. One, one plant sends like 10 or 20 at a time on a more frequent basis, whereas the other plant uh, loads an entire unit train of 96 cars of ethanol, and then we run it through as one unit train uh, through there. And then, of course, you will see the return of empty cars going westbound through there as well. Um, the other uh, material that we haul that could raise concerns is we do haul liquid liquefied propane, which is run out to uh, uh, western Minnesota, where it's transloaded and delivered to those areas. Um, and those two, we have the Federal Railroad Administration is the administration that governs all things railroad safety. And so we have strict standards that we have to abide by with respect to hauling hazardous materials, including having the train crews have the proper documentation on their person while they're running the train. And so should an incident ever occur, as Chief alluded to, uh, the fire department can has an app that they can just put, punch in the car number and they can know what the commodity is in that car, but as a backup measure, they could also ask the train crew and they would know as well. Um, we have two types of trains. I will call them scheduled trains and not scheduled trains. Uh, the scheduled trains are basically Monday through Saturday, we will run what we call a mixed train or a manifest train, which is uh, can be as little as 15 cars, can be as 80 to 100 cars of mixed commodities. And we basically alternate one day we'll interchange with Union Pacific, one day we'll interchange with Canadian Pacific and, and flip-flop. And then there's a Minnesota Commercial Railroad that we interchange in St. Paul as well, which will bring cars to BNSF and Santa Fe, I mean, BNSF and Canadian National. Um, but these are all less, you know, single cars to five car blocks, that kind of thing. Then we have our unscheduled trains, which are basically, we do unit corn trains, unit soybean trains. Uh, about once a month, you'll see a westbound unit coal train. Um, 
we do unit ethanol trains, as I mentioned, and then the byproduct of the ethanol plants called distillered dried grains, which is an animal feed, and we do do unit trains of that as well. And the issue with unit trains is we receive the empty train lock, stock, and barrel from the large railroad, usually in St. Paul or sometimes in northeast Minneapolis or north Minneapolis, depending on the railroad. And we try to time it so that our crews get to that spot when their crew arrives, so that their crew gets off the train, we get on, and away we go. And that's the way they like it. Trouble is, those can happen any time of day or night. And so uh, when you hear trains going through the middle of the night, that's a train that we uh, they d dropped off in St. Paul at, say, uh, midnight. And so it might take us two till 2 in the morning to come through the corridor. Uh, but then they also have strict, uh, since it's their equipment, they have strict time parameters on when our customers can say load the corn unit corn train and then we have to bring it back to the large railroad loaded within a certain period of time. Otherwise, there's penalties and, and the penalties are significant. And so those are kind of the economic issues we deal with. But we certainly safety is paramount to us. Uh, we are really focused on two elements of safety. Uh, one element is, of course, the safety of our employees and our communities that we go through. And then the second one is the safety of our actual train operation. So we don't we don't like to have expensive derailments because they're expensive. So we do everything in our power to uh, prevent that. And I'm happy to say it's been over two years since we've had a, a derailment that's risen to the degree of being reportable, which is basically ten thousand dollars or more in expense. So. Uh, our our entire team is focused on safety. We have a safety manager that goes out and augments our safety protocols. We have two uh, supervisors of locomotive engineers, as I mentioned earlier, who go out and inspect. And uh, up to now, uh, as of the end of October, there have been 75 random inspections of our train crews in this vicinity since uh, this in 2023. So that's 75 times where our supervisors are laying in the weeds and us is spying on our train crews to make sure they are running safely and by the rules. So those are kind of the elements of safety that we do. And then as Jim Alexander alluded to with this uh, most recent issue, um, we are trying to enable the Met Council and their contractors enough time to do a certain segment of that shallow tunnel, seal it off, and then ensure the freight track is stable before the next train comes through. And that'll be completely dependent on these extra trains when they when they're when they're scheduled to come through. So today, for instance, we couldn't give them a window because we were expecting a coal train in at noon, and I think it it, it didn't arrive till about three. I wanted three or three thirty, so it may be going through the neighborhood as we speak. I don't know. Um, but anyways, those are kind of the things about the freight rail, and I I uh, absolutely appreciate all of your concerns and everything. But rest assured. Safety is our number one priority. So that's what uh, what I would say. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you again for being here today. Um, like I said, well, we we do have plenty of time now uh, to ask your questions. I do just want to acknowledge too um, with. Uh, thank you all who are able to join us in that rail exercise this summer. Um, it was nice to um, get together with you. And um, I helped a little bit just to coordinate some of the, you know, elements that were not in the corridor. And I want to thank uh, Metro Transit for helping us with that. And we needed the collaboration of the uh, construction contractors as well as BNSF and Twin Cities and Western to be able to do the exercise in the corridor. So I do appreciate that um, everybody worked with us um, on that exercise. But um, yeah, so we are now open for questions. The best thing to do would be to raise your hand or you could just chime in. You can put your question in the chat, but I generally prefer that if you have a question, if you're able to, and maybe you can just share with us verbally what your question is. All right, Mark Nichols, looks like the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. 
Mark, we can't hear you yet. If you're hey Mark, you might be mute, muted there. Speaking. Anytime, if anyone else wants to get in queue, we can kind of track that. But so, Mark, we're still not hearing you at this time. So it shows he's on mute. So if he could figure mm -hmm. out how to unmute. Yeah. Yeah, it's the oh, icon so, um, at the top. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Um, we'll go with Richard, and then we'll get back to. Oh, Mark. if you want to uh, say something. Well, you know, our neighborhood is in a unique situation. We are, I'm talking about to the Chowan Avenue, Avenue West 32nd Street area, which is now a cul-de-sac because of the light rail construction and the Westlake Quarter construction. So the Abbott to Chowan Avenue access is cut off. Last winter, we were cut off for several days. And I, I know there was a heavy snowstorm, but our West 32nd Street never got cleared. If there had happened to be a rail emergency, I don't know what would have happened, especially if people tried to get into their cars to flee and thus block the only access that emergency vehicles would have coming into the neighborhood. So, um, and of course, you know, hundreds of people live within just yards of the rail line in all wood buildings with no sprinkler systems. So I'm I'm just asking that some special consideration be given to uh, an area such as ours. I'm talking about the cluster around the intersection of Chowan Avenue and West 32nd Street. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote to you about it, Lauren. Yeah, no, I wanted to one, I just want to mention to Mark. So Mark, you did figure out how to unmute yourself. Uh, we can hear papers shuffling, which is fine. Just want you to know, we'll get to your question in just a minute. Thank you. Uh, but but yes, Mr. Logan, we I I think we're all familiar with um, the concerns that you have raised recently in that email today um, on this matter. So that has been shared with people. Um, and I think some of those issues, too, that you raised today, um, you know, we'll need to, you'll want to make sure that your new city council member um, Hears from you about some that's appropriate to go through your council member. Yes, Katie but I Cashman, will see. Yeah, we're we're getting we're in touch with her. Yes, great. Um, but I will see if anyone wants to comment because I do know that people are familiar with your concerns about accessibility to that area and um, snow removal causing narrowing of the street and so on. So does anyone want to address that right now or have information relevant to that from the city um perhaps or well i will say from the uh fire department standpoint we are very familiar with that uh intersection in that area uh, we do monitor it to to make sure that we could get in uh but we can also pass that information all along to public works to make sure that uh you know the plowing is is done and let them know that uh, you yeah. know that area could be a real challenge if it's not plowed uh you know, very well, I, so. I, I talked to your I talked to your firefighters quite a bit about it, and they 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 re, they do understand it. And I, but getting some something done higher up, like West Thirty Second Street, never gets cleared of cars uh, in the winter. Never, there's never enough towing, uh, to so that so that vehicles could get through. So, but we appreciate we appreciate that kind of support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, we saw your email and and your question too about whether that should be a, a snow emergency uh street and so on so like uh, she said we could pass that on to some folks and then if you'll be talking to your council member that will also be helpful but um thank you for raising that uh, mark did you have a question Yes, uh, thank you. I, I finally figured out how to make the uh, unmute <laughs> button work, and I, I do appreciate uh, the chance to ask a question and to uh, and to learn uh, about, in particular, the drill. I did have a couple questions for Chief Tyner. One being, he referenced the uh, iPods uh, telephone, much like Amber Alert, and I'm wondering, uh, Chief, if you know, or if someone else, maybe on your staff, would know. Uh, particularly for the route of the uh, light rail construction project, 
what percentage of the population um, may have that. Uh, and then um, if that can be determined, is there a way to encourage um, ideally everybody, but I realize not everybody has a cell phone, not everybody you know, perhaps would be uh, able to do that. But um, my concern is that if there was a more significant uh, event requiring either shelter in place or evacuation that having the biggest population uh, percent possible having that capability would be a great aid. Um, would, would you agree? I would agree. Uh, I don't know the, you know, the exact, uh, because we're, we're talking about a message that goes out to every smartphone and every uh, iPad. I don't know, you know, the percentage of people that that do have those and don't have those. Um, but again, it's one of, uh, you know, a number of ways that we uh, get that messaging out. It is the fastest way to get it to the most people. And so that's why we, we like to use it. But, you know, we also use traditional media, uh, social media and just, you know, door to door uh as a backup also so so we will be doing you know all four of those things in the case of one of these types of emergencies sure i i understand that and the multiple channels are, are a great thing um what i might suggest though is um uh, a local campaign to uh, raise the awareness of the you know maybe a mailing to those that are in that in that area to really suggest if they have not done so that they sign up for that because it would be a, a benefit to them in a number of cases, not just you know a rail incident, but it could be you know tornado shelter or or whatever it might be. Sure. So that, that's well, one that's one issue. The beauty of iPods is that you don't have to sign up for it. Uh, we just determine an area that we want to send the the message out to, or how big that area, or we can send it out to the entire city. And if you own a smartphone or a a, a tablet is, is going to go there. So uh, we did have a, an old system. It was uh, that you did have to sign up for. Uh, we don't use that system anymore. The, we've replaced that with the iPod system. And so uh, you don't have to sign up for it uh, if you're, you know, within the area of, uh, and it could even be statewide. If you're within the area of, uh, you know, that we're looking to, to notify, you will receive it. All right, thank you. I, I didn't know that. I I am familiar with the older style, which I have here in Maplewood, and and so that uh, that's that's very good information. A um, couple other quick things in the course of this uh, drill that your department and and your um, colleagues and and others participated in, were there any lessons learned? In other words, um, either gaps or uh, in con in uh, you might say just whatever it might be, were there any lessons learned that would help, um, you know, to prevent a problem or to reduce a problem in the future if there was an actual emergency? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I did want to touch upon that. So uh, as far as, um, no, we didn't uh, uncover a lot, uh, you know, for the for the incident that we had um, in terms of operations, uh, I think the operations went very well. Uh, they did go slow. Uh, on the other side of it, in terms of a show and tell, uh, I think we could have mm -hmm. done uh, a better job of that. You know, having to uh, visualize a lot didn't really, uh, to me, make for a, a as good as a demonstration as I had hoped. I think if I had to do it over again, uh, I'd probably do it at our training facility where we would have, uh, you know, those rail cars and everything. So you're not having to, you know, imagine what's there that you can actually see us working on the actual stuff so um but outside of that operationally i think things went went actually pretty well as far as uh, what the crews did again we did run out of time so we weren't able to get through the entire scenario but what, if i had to do it over have, then, that's what i would do what what would have been done that was that you ran out of time and weren't able to do what were there any particular uh, facets of the operation that that you would have have done if you had had the luxury of more time? Uh, yeah, I might have had an actual leak. You know, I might have been able to uh, demonstrate how we would, you know, handle a leak, uh, maybe even a fire and demonstrate how we would handle that. Um, but uh, yeah, because of, of time, we, we never really got past the recon stage of it. So we didn't get into the actual mitigation stage. Now, I did read you the, the, uh, the incident as it was, and I didn't make up the incident. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know, that was that Who was uh, other incident? parts of that was other parts of the hazmat team. 
uh, the hazmat leader that actually made it up for the hazmat crews. So, you know, in his incident, there wasn't actually a leak. Um, but I think if I had more time and I was able to do it, I would have actually had a leak or something that we could show you how we mitigate those things. That that just leaves me with one quick question. I appreciate your time. Um, you, you referenced the fact that there was no leak in this particular scenario. Would there be a benefit to having um, another drill, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, involving some observers from the public or not, that would, in fact, uh, put into, into, into uh, action a more threatening incident where you might have a, a rail car, you know, the ethanol that leaks breaches and there's a flowing material mm -hmm. and, it, you know, finds an ignition source, flashes back and now you got a real, uh, a real live yeah. uh, potential catastrophe, but hopefully not uh, on your hands. Absolutely. Would that make well, sense, we, you think? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Would, Go ahead. No, that's right. Would you think that would make sense to take another whack at this with a, a more severe scenario in mind, it, specifically related to that area where there, there's a high population density and the situation where you could have a conflict between freight rail and passenger rail okay so i would you know we actually practice more uh you know complex incidents all the time uh but if, if uh, i do think it would be uh maybe have some some value to be able to have something for the public but again if we were to do something like that. I would probably recommend doing it at the training tower. It wouldn't be in your neighborhood and on your tracks. Uh, it would be out at our facility, you know, where we have those props and are able to kind of do those things. So you're not having to, to visualize things. You can actually see it. All right, thank you, sir. Chief. Can I can I add something? This is uh, Assistant sure. Chief Ambigo. Uh, Lauren. Wait which goes into it, it kind of ties into the end of that. We have sent members of our hazmat team up to Camp Ripley to a uh, class it's called Jersey. It's a Joint Emergency Response Training Center up there. And they actually do get hands-on training with hazmat tankers, any uh, transportation involved hazard ma hazardous material spills. And ever since we've become a state team, we have been sending our hazmat uh, personnel from station 11 up there and then they come back and they do conduct class with each other so that they're bringing back the most recent information and updates and they do those are all live training exercises up there at camp ripley thank you wes um, um, lauren, yeah lauren this, this is representative hornstein and senator dibble um we have to run now i have to get to another meeting um but i just wanted to thank everybody for being on the call and um you know appreciate everybody's involvement and obviously there's some some things that we'll want to follow up with you on and uh, we did pass a, a rail safety provision in the transportation bill this year i've been in touch with mr nichols there's some things that might need to be tweaked in that um and i think we will uh senator dibble and i will want to follow up with uh Mr. Alexander on some of the uh, issues that he raised around the um, the geology, the ongoing geology problems uh, related to the tunnel. But uh, anyway, we wanted to thank you. And I don't know, Senator Dibble, if you wanted to say anything. No, um, we'll uh, go back and uh, listen to the tape of the remainder of this meeting. Um, Okay. if anything else comes up that we need to follow up on. So thank you very much, Lauren, for getting this all set up. Well, thank Senator, you for Senator Dibble and uh, Representative Hornstein, I would like to uh, thank you before you go. Uh, the state did uh, cover the cost of this exercise, so uh, we were really appreciative of that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to hear that. Yeah, thank right. you. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, you happy too. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks okay. for joining Bye -bye. us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We certainly all appreciate the hard work that uh, Senator Dibble and Representative Hornstein do on our behalf and are always concerned about rail safety. Um, all right, so we can resume questions and I think we let's try to see if we can get out of here a little earlier than planned and we can conclude by 715, no later than. Um, are there any other questions that people have?
don't worry, I won't make us sit here quietly for 15 minutes if there aren't if there aren't additional questions, we can go. It's still a pretty nice day if you haven't gotten out for a walk or something. Seeing any hands up yet. Uh, Chief, Richard Logan again. I just want to say how much I appreciate. I go over to our, our fire station here. 20, is it station 22? 22, uh, yes. Yeah, I, and I talk to the duty captains. And you're right. They are very diligent in... Uh, reconnoitering the neighborhood and, and checking on things. And we, we, we appreciate that kind of dedication too. But as I said, a lot of them, a lot of the firefighters do ex con convey how hard it is to get into our neighborhood. Uh, you know, because the streets are always fully parked in and if you add a storm emergency on top of that, it's, it's extremely challenging. But we appreciate your firefighters very much. Thank you. And your, and your captains. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, I'm not seeing any hands up. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, so I think we will prepare to conclude here. Again, um, thank you. And then one final, um, I did not thank the neighborhood organizations, but certainly as we were trying to select a date that was gonna be accessible and, and thinking about the agenda for today, we did um, seek out uh, input from um, Cedar Isles Dean Neighborhood Association, from Kenwood, from Bede Makoska. Um, they also helped to reach residents who may be interested in tonight's meeting and exercise this summer. Um, so I appreciate all of the um, leaders in those neighborhood organizations. Again, thanks for being here and um, have a good night then we'll conclude. Thank you right. for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Lauren. You. Thank you, Lauren, Thank you. for organizing. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Lauren. Good yeah, night. Bye bye.